Welcome to The Corner, La Source's digital show dedicated to the sport and entertainment industry. Every two weeks, we invite a professional to share their experience, background, and challenges. The sport industry moves fast, and having their insights is the best way to keep up to speed. Welcome to The Corner. Famous game Fortnite released its long awaited Creative 2.0 mode. Thanks to Move.ai, this update is a revolution in terms of ultra personalization and augmented reality. In order to ride this wave, we had the pleasure to receive Niall Andre, a good friend of ours and obviously head of partnerships at Move.ai. In this episode, Niall tells us why mocap, motion capture, and Move in particular can be the front door to virtual worlds. Have a great listening. Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of Le Corner. This is my pleasure and privilege to welcome Niall today, Niall from Move. And hey, Niall, how are you doing? Good man, how are you? Thank you for having me. Yeah, all good. Um, we were just having a quick chat and I was just explaining and I think it's it's important for, for those listening to us. It's, uh, it's going to be a tricky one for me today because... We've had many discussions. I know you for quite some time now, um, yeah. and I need to to start from scratch to try explaining what you guys do, what, how, how you're gonna disrupt that space and everything. So I, I will try to I will try to remain normal and, and try to to take it to the basics. <laughs> Normal's boring. Let's 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 remain fun at all times. <laughs> yeah, boy. I mean, you you have stories to tell. Um, usually, the the way we like to 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 start is to have a bit of an understanding of who you are. Like, we like to know a bit of the invite here. I mean, it's it's common now in the podcast world. Uh, but if you can just like present a little bit yourself, uh, your background, what what you were doing before move, uh, yeah, just so that we know who you are. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I. Started out my career in sports tech um, broadcast um, back with Higo Group um, uh, in 2012. Uh, and that was, um, at the time, doing things such as the Sky Sports touchscreens for Monday Night Football or um, live AR graphics for golf. Um and um sort of moved when quickly. That? When from, was that, Niall? When <clears> that was that? the the first production I was on was 2012, so Monday Night Football. Um, so like uh, eleven years ago now, ten years ago. Um, yeah, yeah. And, um, we, it, do you know what? At the time, it was like super revolutionary. I think touch screens have become so like ingrained in every one's you know. A understanding of how you communicate through any device, but especially at the time, those Monday night fo- football touchscreens really like broke the mold uh, in terms of how to present sports, right? Um, and Higo was at the forefront of that. And um, we then uh, merged with Chiron to form Chiron Higo. So one of the global leaders in uh, broadcast mm-hmm. graphics in general. And I, um, over time, took on and built the... Uh, sports product team with a former colleague of mine, Mark Bowden, who's now um, at Football Data Co. And we um, ended up, you know, building a sports product portfolio to include uh, telestration tools for drawing on video, um, such as um, the Coach Paint tool, which was the widest at the time, uh, wide, most widely used analysis tool in sports at one point in time. We had over 350 clubs using it across all sports, um, to virtual graphics sports, so down and distance lines for the NFL, um, augmented advertising for Formula One, for Premier League, for um, Serie A. Um, and then we also had um, track apps. So, so just tracking. for me to understand, like when you say you were building the product, so you were yeah. building the product from a sports performance standpoint, and then once you had all the market or the you were the market leaders, then podcast and team. Yeah, what happened was um, we had um, built the Monday Night Football touchscreen 
thing. And we done it. Uh, we had a GS2, which was the the Higo technology at the time, actually integrated with Piero, um, which was owned by Red B Media at the time, now owned by Ross. Um, and we had a number of football clubs come to us, being like, "Oh, you're the Monday night football people. We want to do that in the changing room or in the in the training ground." We were like, "Okay." And I think we rocked up to Watford when Gianfranco Zola was the manager with like this HP server and a screen. And they were like, that's not going to work, guys. That's not going to work at all. Um, and we were like, okay, maybe that's not the way. So, to so you are the reason why you have tablets and plenty of analysts everywhere like in the locker room, next to the pitch sides, uh, at the top like of the, the stadium, of always yeah. iPads and touching everywhere. All right. Yeah, basically like, and there are other tools in that ecosystem to do things like event coding, etc. But in terms of the, it was the first version of that. Yeah. And like when, then we went to uh, Manchester City and um, the, the team there at the time um, were, super super forward thinking they were like look if you can put this on a mac you will own this market and we sort of went back as a product team and went to the drawing board and went okay went so that there was like there's an opportunity here we mapped out the size of the sports analysis opportunity globally especially when you start looking at the u.s college market etc and we're like this is worthwhile doing and we went to the, the development team at, um in Bruno in the czech republic and went we need to do this on a laptop. And the CTO at the time, Marek Fort, went, our developers are already running it on their laptops. And we went, well, why don't you just tell us that? That's brilliant. So we managed to port it to Mac within like six months. And then basically, yeah, within three in the market years, and that just went? Yeah, went to market with it, basically. And it was an organic growth thing as well. It was like, word of mouth amongst football teams initially um but i think within i don't know a year we had all the premier league teams using it the league-wide deal in germany to have both tiers of the bundesliga using it the same with la liga um picked up a number of um israeli league uh did like a lot of like league-wide distribution deals with the with the coach paint product as well but that was born of a broadcast product so what was really nice about it is the same code base that was on tv on the final four championships on Turner was also being used in the locker rooms by the Raptors, uh, you know, for the NBA. So um, there was a really, is a really nice crossover there. And that was the analysis side of stuff. Um, but then we also had the player tracking data. So TrackAb was really one of the first of its kind um, using computer vision and AI to automatically track the positions of players on a football pitch. Um, funnily enough, that was originally developed as a um, missile detection system, I believe, between Saab and the Swedish military and Trakab. And I think quite quickly the team there decided to put it to more humane use um, and point it at people running around on a sports field. Um, but Trakab was really like one of the and the team that built that in Stockholm, uh, like some of the world leading experts in like real time AI processing. Mm -hmm. And um, they really uh, built what was the first scaled tracking technology. I think at a certain point in time at TrackAb, we had um, Premier League, Bundesliga one and two, La Liga one and two, J League, Polish League, Danish League, um, UEFA, FIFA. Major League Baseball, the Mexican League, all the top guns, all the two one. Yeah, it was a, it was a, at one point in time it was a beast, um, and it powered the data from that powered both in ex, like in product experiences. So things like we were able to drive real time player circles augmented over a broadcast feed with live speeds coming out of them. Like this was like ten years ago we were doing this. And people are still yeah. doing it now and think it's revolutionary. So um, <clears throat> it's um, – and that, um, around that technology sphere um, and around 2019, we were um, embarking on a project with Johannes Holtzmuller's team over at FIFA around um, what would be the next generation of offside calling system – 
Um, and at the time, we built a virtual offside line system, which allowed an operator to, you know, calibrate broadcast cameras and click in mm-hmm. the video, right, for VAR. Yeah. And ultimately, if you remember on the VAR stuff, that the clicking, an op- a person pressing on a pixel got a lot of criticism quite quickly. And um, mm-hmm. rightly so, you know, FIFA said there has to be a way in the market to automatically do this relative to mm-hmm. so they brought everyone together from track Ab to hawkeye second spectrum stats a number of others and said this is the direction we're going to go in the market go for it and so we fortunately at track Ab, were already sort of building a first generation yeah. skeletal tracking system and however at the time we were really good at core technology But like the visualization side of things, ironically, for a graphics company, wasn't brilliant. And I um, was at an event at the old BBC in London where I saw a presentation from the Move AI CEO, Tino Miller, talking around the next generation use of AI to reconstruct the human body to be able to view it from any angle in a game engine. Um, and I thought at the time with my uh, track ab product hat on, I was like, we should partner with these guys. Like that's a, that's a, a good solution to that have. That would be a clever move. Yeah. And um, we, so I approached Tino and Anthony, uh, Anthony Ganju, our other co-founder, and said, look, I think we've got all these leagues you're doing this visualization thing. If we plug our, you know, technology into your technology, we've got a really robust, potentially market leading solution for this. And we explored it and explored it for a couple of months. And then Move went through, I think, its first angel round of investment. And I got a phone call from Anthony um, asking if I wanted a job. So um, I uh, left track. So you, you quit a bit the, the corporate big uh, data I and mean, big like service yeah. provider for a kind yeah. of a startup. Uh, yeah, for for a, for a, for a couple of mavericks and a great idea at the time. Um, and um, we, uh, yeah, it was it would you know it's funny because like some people were like you're crazy. Other people went, if that tech works, that's like the next gen. And that's what I thought, right? When I saw the way that Tino and Ant had built the vision for the future of the business, I was like, it'd be remiss of me if someone working in this industry not to join the next generation of yeah. human movement extraction. Like I would be, I'd regret it forever if I didn't do that. So uh, I'm a bit biased board. here, but uh, I do agree. I mean, that's <laughs> but I'm biased, it's, so I'm not saying anything. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those ones. I think it's what any moving from that sort of larger corporate to a startup is of like you know, it can be frightening, but ultimately, like it's different, it's a different part of your life, right? That's the whole thing. It's not just a new job, it's a new challenge, it was an opportunity to go in as head of product and build the product from the ground up with the great tech team that are already in place. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was the middle of COVID as well. And um, mm-hmm. so, yeah, starting a new job, strange then. And But, yeah, anyway, joined officially moving, I think, June 2020, so almost three years ago now. Um, and initially, my remit was head of product um, to build the product um, from what was a great idea and a bunch of independent technologies into a cloud-deployed solution that we managed to patent along the way, um, that we then um, have distributed along with a really good um, relationship that we've managed to garner with Electronic Arts. Um, we were introduced to EA quite early um, in our journey at Move, and the motion capture team at the Capture Lab in Vancouver really helped us um, <clears throat> hone the quality of the data for motion capture as opposed to uh, just collecting data skeletally is um, hugely important that you get really high quality data and the EA yeah, team just let, me, let me pause on that Niall because I think I need to explain a little bit for the audience because we 
We know you know about what you're talking about. I yeah. tend to fake what I'm understanding, but that's part of my my job. Uh, so just to wrap up everything you said, like you were a king in terms of event data, moved as a first leader in terms of tracking data, so all the coordinate, the X, Y, Z of all yeah. the, the players. And now you have this kind of next gen where you move to motion capture with volumetric yeah. data. And uh, I think it's not something, I mean, even data people knows about it because it has been there for like more than 20 years now. And it's every time you have a, a penalty kick or a red card or anything, yeah. as soon as you have an event, there's something related to it. It was not enough for the people. I mean, at least for the sports performance guys, because sometimes a player doesn't touch the ball for 88 minutes or for whatever, a very long period of time, but still by moving around, he's creating space or he's doing things that allows the play to get better or to, to break the lines. Uh, without touching the ball, so without having any kind of data yeah. or even. So this is where the tracking data came in, more context, more understanding. And now you have another layer. But the thing is for, I want, because some of the audience don't know about this, like imagine I am three years old. How do you explain like motion capture? What is the, this 4D technology? Like if you have to, to explain it to your nephew or whomever. Yeah, I think like, I mean, I'll, I'll take a little step back firstly anyway, I think into like the sort of football data side of things, like as you say, tracking data for a long time was actually a largely untapped resource in that spatio-temporal analysis. So looking at patterns of play, looking at possession, you know, physicality statistics, things like <clears throat> sprints are incredibly important to monitor like player load and health and that, things like injury prevention, like if you've got someone with high intensity spray in there. Yeah. They're decelerating too quickly. They could potentially injure themselves more quickly. And uh, the richness of that data, I think, um, had evolved over time. And then, <clears throat> you know, the natural progression of going from center of mass, which is one data point on an individual per frame, which still outputs 3 million data points for a game across the whole game, um, was has been seen as not potentially rich enough compared to something like skeletal based motion capture. Um, how to explain motion capture to a three year old? Is that the challenge? <laughs> or a six years old? I mean, <laughs> just to say, like, how do you capture the whole volumetric? I mean, the whole. 3D space and rendering of it compared to... I think it's like producing. how to make Tony Stark Iron Man would be the easiest way to do it. Um, the uh, yeah, Ultimately, like, look, we use video to understand what human is, and then that human's movement can be added to AN environment scene character of your choice. So the way to explain it to a three-year-old would be like, do a dance... Give me two minutes and we'll make you Tony Stark. That's the uh that's the uh the way of looking at it. But um the the way the tech works in essence is that um on the move side we use a number of video angles looking at a human being. And we use AI um to look at what is called pose estimation, which is basically the human body's movements <clears throat> based on their joints or their bones. And what we patented is a methodology by which to process that data. So we run that um, pose data through a series of biomechanical um, models that apply things like constraints to your joints because um, your body bends, extends, and flexes in a certain way. Um, kinematic rules around that. And we also apply physics to that as well so that the laws of gravity are applied to the human movement. And what that gives us is a resulting file or stream that can be utilized to power um, all sorts of use cases, whether it's um, things like um, character animation for video games, mm -hmm. whether it's, um, you know, statistics for insights, um, whether it's, you know, almost like skeletal analysis for things like uh, joint rotations, flexions and extension. Uh, ultimately, we output a really high fidelity motion capture output. Yeah, and so yeah, and I was just thinking that maybe for the for the listeners, it's 
it's like you're removing. I mean, we all have this kind of vision of like this uh, green backgrounds with all yeah. the MC suits and everything, like in the movie theater and, and yep. stuff like that. I mean, in the movie industry or even the fashion or all that kind of things. And even for EA, you mentioned EA games, like the way you replicate the human body trying to look as if they were real. I think the promise for me to, uh, I think is like the real promise of movies, like you you remove all these costs, but you remove all of that so that the body language can be like fully um, free, actually, to play as yeah. it wants. But it's also like any character can become or any person can become a creator, but also like this kind of, the next whomever, Ronaldo, Bappe, or kind of the player you want, Nadal, Roger of this world. Yeah, I mean, to, like contextually there, basically, the way that <clears throat> you traditionally do motion capture is by putting on a motion capture suit. Uh, there are different ways of doing that. Um, there are some uh, optical-based systems, and by that we mean... You put on a lycra suit, you place uh, up to or beyond 50, 5 zero markers, reflective markers, on strategic positions on the body, which are then captured by a number, a often a high number, of built by manufacturer that provides the motion capture cameras that run infrared. So they look at the reflections on the markers um and then process that again to like a very high quality level um data and then rebuild the data to estimate what the human body is relative to those markers there are alternative ways to do it still wearing suits where you have inertial markers so like in the sports world like Mm -hmm. you know like you've got your um the bibs with the gps um markers in uh, the trackers in them with accelerometers etc in them so imagine like 10 of those strapped to strategic points on the body Um, Mm. and um the uh, and there are you know there are the methods to do that can output data uh that's okay um and that's a very long established way of doing it and ultimately where we found with the team at ea is that Relative to some of their IP, um, they need to capture motion capture more people in larger areas to get authentic sporting gameplay. And um, where they, um, uh, and also, you know, talent don't really like wearing suits. Like performers are constricted by suits, the markers can fall off. Uh, utilizing an immersion, an inertial system, the, um, the, de- the data can be prone to drift. And by that, I mean is that where you think the person is over time, the data can actually move away from where they actually are because inertial systems are prone to doing that. Likewise, like GPS systems, right? They're never fully accurate. Like when you wear like just, yeah. and things like that, they're always in a region of where the player is. Um, the um, other consideration is that um, – the, some systems you can't interact with the floor or come off of the floor. And when that happens, the data will drop through the floor or float into the sky. And the difficulty there is that in, in a workflow where you have a motion capture team providing motion capture data, they then hand that data often over to an animator who then needs to take that data and apply it to a character, but also remove any noisy data, and that's called cleanup. Um, When they do that, um, if you've got bad data or data that's not as good as it could be, it creates a lot of work on that individual or team of individuals to then smooth or clean up the data. And the problem with doing that is the more that you clean up motion capture data, the less of the mocap is kept, and therefore it becomes just more of a synthetic animation. It doesn't look real. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I mean, I would encourage anyway, anybody listening to us, maybe to pose, or if they cannot pose now, but at least to 
have a look once they are behind their laptop or anything in terms of watching what it means actually to do this kind of mocap where you are free. Yeah. You can be three or four. And everything you, you've just said in terms of normally you need to set up everything. You are not free really of moving. The cameras you have are quite heavy investments or in terms of processing. And so all of that is kind of, okay, now we're moving with like four iPhones, potentially two and now one, just capturing it without anything uh, on the body, which is like, yeah. that's exactly. the game changer, right? With the, the same power- accuracy of data. Exactly. So our approach was to go, we can do this from video and we can do this from video that's not expensive to capture. And <clears throat> initially we deployed the system on a GoPro pace workflow. GoPro is pretty cheap, um, but the workflow wasn't brilliant. And we were like, you have to offload files from the, from the, the cameras, you have to upload them to the cloud. And we went back to the drawing board and went, we can do this from iPhones. Um, and we basically went out last year, built an iPhone um, stack and an iPhone app that is able to then allow anyone to then, uh, from the likes of your EA to the top of the market, to a creator in their bedroom, to utilize mobile devices to be able to create uh, AAA quality motion capture from devices that may even be sat around their house. And as such, um, we really had a huge influx of, we'd, our ambition was to have a thousand people signed up to our beta, to our subscription before the app mm-hmm. launched. We launched that in October. Um, we had on the 28th of February, 20,000 people on our wait list ready to uh, come on board on the creator app. So we really took a view on the market that the creator economy and the um, future of the 3D creative industry uh, is going to be fueled not just by the high end, but by people who have good ideas with tools that are accessible to them on devices they already own uh, to be able to create amazing content. And so for any kind of creator, it's like, okay, I'm... I'm just creating my own avatar or my own myself and put it just like you mentioned it two or three years old. It's like, you want to walk on the moon? Okay, let me do this two minute video and then let me digest just the data and the video, but then I can put you on the moon or, or anywhere you want. And so you can imagine that for like a Fortnite or Roblox where you could just create your own mocap yourself and then creates scenery or creates whatever stories using Fortnite, Roblox, or even like Unreal Engine and putting whatever context around it. Exactly. And like what you can see as well, in the market, there are a number of tools that are out there and that exist um, to create the avatars, for instance. So like you've got the likes of Ready Player Me um, who create. Yeah, you're working with them, right? Yeah, they um, our data is like cross compatible with their rigs. They posted a really fun clip on their I think LinkedIn and Twitter recently of a boxing sparring thing they did, which was really cool. And that was completely unsolicited. We didn't know it was happening. It was great. Um, <laughs> and we work with the guys at Avaturn as well, who do some really nice facial scanning. Um, and also like with the Meta Human team at Epic Games, who are creating really high fidelity, um, high fidelity um, human rigs called Meta Humans. And, you know, what's great about our technology and the data that we provide is it can go to any of those touch points again. So it can go to the high end and it can go to the accessible end of the market as well. And as you say, with the likes of Unreal Engine being, uh, you know, free to access, uh, Unity being very straightforward to use, the likes of the update that Epic Games just released for Fortnite, Unreal Engine Fortnite, so... Fortnite Creator 2.0, um, that's really democratizing and proliferating the ability for creators to create content easily mm-hmm. and be able to monetize that. Likewise, with Roblox, I think there's something like 10,000 independent creators on Roblox. And all of these platforms have audience as well, right? So you are ultimately getting 
a, there are a set of tools that are being opened up to the market of which we are one um, to be able to enable people with great ideas to create amazing content more straightforwardly than has ever been possible before. I'm trying to to think in terms of like people to understand. I'm also interested like on the business model because um, that's not the same when you're on the high end and, and the low end. I mean, you cannot you cannot supercharge the low end, and but we understand that. But how does it? I mean, I guess the the numbers and the idea to have like a hundred thousand, a hundred k people. Is something where you want to have the uh, a price point which is not like a, a burden or something preventing you to to have the volume, but at the same time, I mean, the quality you have, the more cap that you're doing, it's also for me it's revolutionary to a certain extent. Where given the costs and what, just looking at the cost line, it's already revolutionary. But also every kind of services or everything that you can build on from a pure business model. It's all, it's already something also where it's really, really interesting in terms of if I'm an IP, I mean, if I'm a brand or if I'm a, like a rights holder, a whomever, league, I can see so many potential, but how do you, so I guess you have some kind of a business model for the creators and potentially for rights holders or I don't know, companies which are more on the high end. How hard yeah. do you work on that yeah. two fronts? No, that's a that's a good question. I mean, like the there they are inherently sort of different markets, right? As well, the mm -hmm. creator business model is business pure model play is subscription. Pure play. We have been able to basically because we process everything in the cloud, we were able to pass the benefit of the cost of that back on to the creator market, um, and the you know the pricing model there is a dollar a day. So $365 for 365 days in mocap. Um, that is, um, you know, fair use limited at 30 minutes per month. But the idea is to make it access as access. And that to end for context, that's six hours of motion capture over a 12 month period. That's like two feature films. Um, mm. It's a lot of mocap. Um, the, it's, it is, it's a lot of data. Um, and the, uh, the idea there is to allow the price point to reflect the nature of that market and allow people to to then be able to afford to do high quality motion capture um, on. And what's great about the mobile app as well is that we are compatible with on the iPhone side of things, uh, old mobile devices. So we can we're actually compatible with any iPhone from the eight until the fourteen Pro. And you can mix. So if I have the iPhone 8, I don't need to change. I can use it directly. Exactly. And you can then basically utilize that iPhone that's probably sat in a drawer doing nothing um, and then be able to use, you know, minimum of three right now to be able to capture some data. We've also just launched what we're calling experimental mode. Um, and <laughs> the reason for which is that during our beta, we realized that. Some users were not hacking the system, but throwing other video types through it to see what would happen. There was a, a user that used, I think, four Lenovo uh, webcams. There was someone that used some Samsung uh, Galaxy S8s. There was someone else who threw GoPros in it as well. Um, and we were like, and the results were good. So we've launched. Uh, in companion to the iPhone app, experimental mode where users can shoot on any HD device they want and mix and match those and upload those to the platform and see what they get out of it, but with a no guarantee that it's going to be any good um, caveat <laughs> because we have no control over things like the lens parameters or the sensor of the camera. Mm. Um, but it's yielding some pretty good results. Um, but yeah, the, the 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 creator tier is pure play subscription for mass market adoption. That's the business model there. Um, <clears throat> the opposite end of the market for your like AAA um, productions, for instance, let's say uh, those IP owners have um, 
largely a larger need to process more data and more mm-hmm. um, specific to their IP scenarios, whether it's more people, larger volumes. And they also have a lot of requirements on security of IP uh, where we deploy mm-hmm. a custom virtual private cloud offering. You know, all of that then becomes a, an enterprise deal that, you know, starts yeah, yeah. in a six-figure range. Um, with in terms of how we work with teams, rights holders, leagues, it can depend on what they're trying to achieve. So ultimately, we want people to be able to utilize the application in itself, whether that's us deploying it for them for a particular activation um, or, whether it's a case of, yeah. Yeah, or whether it's a case of where there is a revenue generating experience uh that can be powered by the ip holder uh let's say like it's a an experience in fortnite for instance or in a game engine that uh mm-hmm. is monetizable by sponsors or by selling tickets or what have you or by selling things like emotes or um movement based on player movement for instance we would then look to so you're creating new uh, ips in that, new in that regard, you have the kind of traditional for, for clubs to say, okay, like you have this into Fortnite or Roblox, so it's new idol or it's acquisition of new maybe fans. And so the sponsor exposure means additional value to any kind of sponsorship deal or for ticketing or merch stuff that you want to place out there. But at the same time, if a player is doing a, a specific move or a specific something characteristic that you can ip and then you get a rev share for them it's a new revenue stream that you can exactly yeah exactly like what you see is like it's a new revenue stream from your existing ip ultimately the um you'll know this better than anyone jb but across the board and like let's say outright Sports leagues, teams and federations are terrified around losing the eyeballs that are not watching their content and that those eyeballs are all in the digital platforms such as roblox such as fortnite vr chat and others <clears throat> and even when they do watch sports content they digest it in a wholly different way to the way you or i do and even generations above us the they want short form content they want viral content they want hero moments that they don't have to sit and watch for 90 minutes of an event to get. And said rights holders are aware of that um, and are looking for ways to engage where the audience is. And um, where Move fits into that is, you know, we can help power those fan engagement experiences in those, whether it's an AR, VR, fully digital immersive world, Um, by taking the seamlessly, frictionlessly capturing the movement of those talented players, either using our iPhone setup, using using archive content, for instance, and then bringing that to life as a monetizable asset within those experiences and worlds to seed and digest into that market and try and get those young fans hooked early so that when they are older, they may want to, attend a game they may want to buy physical merch rather than virch um there's a there's a number of you know i think the nba do a great job of doing this across different platforms right and you can sort of see that they always lead the market in terms of um yeah, you know, their digital first approach <laughs> if, if the listeners are still there i think pose and that's the last two minutes that you need to rewind and to re-listen for if you need to, to to remind you of like for the last 40 minutes, what we've said, just pause, take the last two minutes and amen to what you just said. I mean, for me, it's like for any kind of people working in the sports industry, this is clearly go find there where they are and everything is put on the eyeball today in the sport industry from the rights value, from anything which is there while we know it's declining. So... For me, it's just like Move is one of the solutions, if not the solutions, to try to get the kids or to give them what they want and the way they want. 
exactly. actually and be more active into it. Because sports sells, right? Ultimately, like, you know, the when you see a crossover of like Antoine Griezmann doing a fortnight emote as his celebration, like, you know, sports and culture are so intrinsically linked to one another. And ultimately, because sport is all about movement, there's no better company, we think, place to move to enable um, hero movement to be digested in these different environments. I think it's it's a natural evolution. It's just making sure that the rights holders meet the demographic in a meaningful way to that demographic. And that ultimately in a fun way, right? Because the reason why a lot of the Gen Z and ultimately alpha and tail end of millennial um, demographics are in virtual worlds, digital gaming experiences. It's because they're having fun there. So, you know, don't take a boring sentiment or idea into these environments. It's got to be fun. It's got to be engaging. It's got to be impactful. Don't be like me. Don't be all like me and trying to replicate what you what you were seeing on linear TV or uh, even early days of uh, social media yeah. and try. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Uh, but just on that specific point, because I wanted, I have a few questions still to pick up your brain because we've all seen the hype around the metaverse last year and everything like that, um, around the web three. And we know, and we've seen as well, like big bets. And now we see one year later, plenty of companies, even in football, uh, downsizing, not saying it's over. And I don't think it's over. It's like just putting it across the entire organization or reshaping it because it doesn't have the same market value as it was planned to be or the, the, the business case is not as big as the numbers throwing last year. But how do you see that changing? I mean, what what's your take on that over the next, I would say, two, three years in your own opinion? We live in the age of hype cycles. The... Ultimately, <clears throat> I think four or five years ago, I remember doing a panel, uh, an event, a broadcast tech event at uh, BT Sport, and saying around AI then was a was a, an idea, right? People are AI, what can I do with AI? And it was like the practical uses of AI, and I said this: the practical uses of AI will proliferate the market. You won't even think about how they're being used. Think about like Siri on people's phones, like. Um, that that's a, you know, an easy example to digest. The uh, how that then translated into the broadcast and sports market was, you know, you can see great companies like WSC using AI to automatically create content, things like that, and that happened over time. And that that initial AI hype cycle died down. <clears throat> but you know, Move was founded around that time, and sort of would well placed to pick up on that trajectory as an AI based company. Now we fast forward a few years and web three was the hype cycle in terms of a couple of years ago in terms of both investment and understanding. And ultimately the next generation of the internet is presently being built. Web 3.0 will probably not come to maturation for another five to 10 years. Um, that version of the internet, I think is generally accepted is going to be more interactive, more spatial, more real-time, more customizable. Um, how the metaverse plays into that is, I mean, let's just say like Zuckerberg harpooned it for everyone initially by trying to own it um, with, the, with the naming of his business. And ultimately, where that will pan out is that you get the hype cycle, you can get the sort of even a relative adoption curve and then the sort of petering out and the actual utility that you will see in the next, I think, few years. I think where 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 people have jumped onto it have gone, this is a great idea. Someone else over there is doing it, so I should do it too. And you get different examples of it. Like JP Morgan, I think, built a bank in Decentraland. Like for who? Mm -hmm. Like it, I think that's that's the the question that rights holders 
always have to ask themselves is like, who is it for? Why am I doing it? Some of it I've seen like is just awareness. So people's like, you know, I want to put my brand in this space because there are people in there and I want to get them to interact with the brand. And there's a digital link to it where I maybe buy this digital asset and I get a physical one too. That sort of makes sense. Mm. I think like with, um, you know, everyone jumping into the whole metaverse idea and that seems to have, you know, gained less traction now that it's not been picked up is that ultimately like some of the experiences aren't that good. That's what I said before, right? Like unless it's fun, unless it's engaging, unless it has a purpose, because again, the demographic that you're going after want it to be meaningful and purposeful. It's not just an experience for the sake of it. It's something that matters to them. And I think just having an experience doesn't necessarily mean it's a good experience. Where the uh, that, yeah. that sort of crossover of what Metaverse and, and Web3 is, is ultimately like we'll have a better version of the internet that'll be more interactive and more 3D. Um, where those experiences are built around IP and brand, I think people have dipped their toe in the water. Some have had more success than others. Um, and where the more successful ones have been are better IP, better ideas, the best platforms. You look at stuff, I get, I will mention the NBA again, but what they've done with Fortnite um, with the NBA, like, works. So you can see there are good examples of that. Um, Mm. You can see, you know, the whole NFT scenario, which I'm not going to dive into, but the whole NFT scenario, a lot of teams, clubs, rights holders got into and burned quite badly by that. I think that's what's necessarily tarred a bit the... And also, you know, the stepping away from some of the metaverse activities by the likes of Meta, um, uh, it's just coalesced in a lot of market forces that are leading to a bit of a general economic downturn anyway. Like, I think there's also things to say that, like, economies work in cycles, as we all know. And, you know, there is a larger play macro scenario to look at um, where investing in speculative things as opposed to products that shit make money. Um, yeah, is not cost of capital is that. clearly something. Uh, yeah, politics, economic downturn. I mean, there is other stuff at play, but just if if I was looking at sports entertainment itself, I mean, we know NBA is leading the way, and we're having discussions as well with mm-hmm. some of their teams there because we know what they are looking at. But which which kind of other sports or other IP are trying to be as fun or you know like properly in the shoes of the fan or really trying to put something relevant for them uh that you've come across or or that you see like who is trying to approach it very much in a in a relevant interactive fun kind of young i mean different there's certainly different approaches across different ip holders i think you've got like a cross spectrum of like Football, as you know, is a very diverse market anyway, and you've got certain um, businesses that lead first in that in that environment because they're enabled to, right? So look at Man City are sort of leading a lot of the way in a lot of what they do in their digital experiences because they've been through partnership or uh, through leadership have been able to sort of step into various different ways of doing that, whereas you're going to get some, you know, leagues can potentially be a bit more conservative. Um, I think where the opportunity is for um, sports that are younger by nature, by both their organization and their participants and their audience, sports like breakdancing, like skateboarding, who the captive audience is playing the sport. Therefore, the captive audience following the sport sees those, the, those athletes as relatable and would probably want to see them in an AR lens in their parents' front room or interact with them in a digital environment, like a digital skate park, or go to a virtual, um, I don't know, underground car park and have a dance-off, you know? like I It's think almost those the cultural sports. sports. <laughs> the cultural sports, right? That's, a, that's really, like, where I find it uh, can probably have the most resonance. Like, I don't believe, I firmly I don't believe that anyone wants to watch a full game of football in the metaverse. 
I don't, and I'm old. Yeah, and, right. and even now I cannot watch ninety minutes anymore. So. <laughs> Who do you support again? No one, no one. I'm, <laughs> I've lost it. I grew up in Scotland. I'm ingrained into watching ninety minutes of dross and being able to uh, being able to survive it. I love it. And this leads, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't anymore. But um, and just on what you've just said, I was, I was thinking like because you can see mocap and everything you've said, like it applies to fashion, to, uh, yeah. to gaming industry, to sport, to to many other sectors. And in your beginning of the answers to to the web three, you mentioned five to ten years, which I tend to agree. In terms of gaming, uh, if I see a bit move to which extent you know it's like the we or the promise of the we to do sports as well there's all these kind of things around being physically active and all of that do yep. you see that coming in with that your take in terms of playing a video game without any kind of controller uh and being completely free and having your own avatar that you move at the same time is that something completely re- realistic five years from now or is that something i think see that's after? five years in all honesty, like we can see that our the move solution today runs on a number of cameras in a very short period of time. It'll run on a single camera. Um, that then opens the way for um, mass adoption in home, on webcam, on mobile, to be able to interact with um, digital assets, digital others, people, whether they're non-playable, playable characters or other real people. Um, I can see that happen in the next three years, realistically. Um, the reason for which is twofold. One is that we have actually we announced yesterday our partnership with Disguise, who are the market leader in XR virtual production workflows to take our real time solution invisible to market. Um, that runs in 200 millisecond delay with real-time motion capture being streamed into two milliseconds uh, 200 milliseconds yeah so um well below a second which is great and uh, i actually just saw one of the demos last night that we're going to roll out at nab it's an incredible demo um and the uh the idea there is for like production workflows where you have uh the needs for things like shadows in xr workflows or digital puppeteering where you want to drive a character in real time or things like interacting with an environment, whether it's like a digital object or smoke or fire or water to give you that creative freedom based on human movement. Um, at the same time, we are we launched our Move mobile app and within the next six months, we um, will launch a single camera version of our mocap solution for mobile i can see a future where those two technology approaches could collide and ultimately power the next generation of human movement experience and that could be embedded in um you know as you say like a next generation of a wii game it can allow you to control your television based on gesture it could allow you to actually go into we instead of us doing this uh, podcast sort of through a screen share and an audio recording, we could be sat in a digital environment together. Um, I think as it becomes more prevalent, more powerful, what's great about our system is it's interesting that the more robust it's become over time, the move system has also become more flexible in terms of the video we can throw at it mm. and still maintains that high degree of quality, which we really really put as paramount to the success of our business and so and so for you from what you've just said i mean i love the uh the picture of like rather than having a screen and us chatting rather sitting and being able to to see it or to move around or, or whatever that can be but based on that how do you see move playing in the i mean i'm always trying to think okay what's the future of sports and entertainment yep what is i mean i can see it two three years and i see i mean we've just discussed it and how you you work into this kind of like 
digital environments, being the Roblox or Fortnite of this world and even the web paper, because there is something else. I mean, I don't know what that is, but there is, from what you've just said, there is something even bigger at play now in terms of what it can bring for the future of sports and entertainment. And I think like maybe you movement, can do that. Movement in itself is, I think, as we said before, inherent to sport. But it's also inherent to us like remaining healthy, right? Like, you know, anyone who sits still all day is going to die quickly. Yeah. Um, the At the end of the day, I think being able to use technology to inspire younger people, people that maybe um, are not as in good health as they could be, or that are maybe recovering from injury, for instance, um, to gamify that experience, to enable them to have fun while moving, when they, when they maybe don't have to leave the house to do that. Um, can be linked to sporting IP or brand IP where, you know, a lot of sports organizations have a community angle where they need to engage their communities to move. Now, if you want to reach a mass audience of community, what better way to do it than by maybe embedding it in, let's say it's UEFA, imagine embedding it in like a UEFA application that can be used by school children all across Europe to not only move but learn new skills and compete against one another in different countries for those skills or those movement profiles. Ultimately, that you know could feed into a wider healthcare um, ploy where people mm-hmm. want to use it for physiotherapy or injury recovery or even just workouts. Right, like um, once you have the ability to get decent human movement, the physical motion that can be tied to Sporting IP um, is, is I think, pretty clear. Uh, a move going to do that as a standalone business? No, we'll partner. We will partner. We'll integrate. We will work with technology companies and IP holders mm. to bring a solution to market uh, yeah, to where enable the them. opportunity is. Yeah, to enable them, yeah. I was not even thinking on all the positive impact and the health or social benefits that you could have also from on that angle, but yeah, that, that's clearly something too. Um, I'm quite cautious of the time here, almost an hour. Uh, I know maybe you have some of this stuff on your plate. Um, usually we like to end the podcast with a bit of a personal take, you know, on, uh, recommendation in terms of what we should be looking at and usually we like to say okay if you have a book a series a movie or whatsoever but anything where you would say okay watch this listen to that uh because that's that's a direction or that's something if you are in that space you need to look at or this is something not necessarily you should be careful of but you should pay attention because it's it will bring something one thing i would say is like beware of the generative ai chat gpt fear mongering like try it use it see what it's useful for understand that it's not going to solve all the world's problems or cause them um that uh as we are in a next generation of um understanding of what ai can use i think but more now than ever, the, those types of tools are accessible. Um, and understanding, I think, from as an AI-based company, looking at um, things like generative AI, it's not something to be scared of based on what Elon Musk says, but something to just understand. I think um, that I would say on that level of, you know, where Move AI could go as a business in the future around generative AI, we see a potential path there to generate human movement or automatically. Mm. And um, understanding the benefits to your business of what generative AI can do, I think, is a smart way of getting ahead of the hype cycle and understanding um what I actually could so you are not you, you are into the AI, AI, but you are not necessarily into the hype of generative AI. If I no, and again, I think you'll get this uptake, and then again, the adoption curve will slow off. But 
where generative AI, I think you, I think what I would say is try, that my one recommendation would be don't just dismiss chat GPT, try it, understand what it does, look into what it does and what, how it was built and then formulate an opinion on it before we get into this whirlwind of hype cycle that's already happened to Web3, that's already happened to the metaverse, where people have looked at it, not actually engaged with it, and shot it down in flames. Um, that would be my my present recommendation. One thing that I would encourage everyone to watch when it comes out is also the new Air film about the Michael Jordan um Michael Jordan contract that was signed with Nike. I haven't seen it yet, but I think for anyone who's watched, uh, anyone who listens to this podcast who have list, watched, I think, the majority of the sports documentaries on Netflix, and I think a cinematic view on some of that stuff that we all saw on The Last Dance or pre-Last Dance is going to be quite cool mm-hmm. to uh, to get insight on. So I would say when that comes out, go and watch it because it will be highly entertaining based on the cast and the story. Mm-hmm. You know, like, it's funny enough because The Last Dance, everybody forgot about it. I mean, most of the people because of the uh, Drive to Survive and all this F1. But The Last that Dance is one of the... It is utterly, like, I remember when Drive to Survive came out and <clears throat> it was brilliant. And I watched it. I was like, this is amazing. Um, and But when Last Dance came out, I was actually late to The Last Dance. And a friend of mine I used to work with was... Uh, Jen Pownessa, she was... Uh, I'm already telling you it's amazing. She went, She went. you're a sports fan if you've not watched it. I, was like, I haven't had time. She was like, don't speak to me again until you've watched it. And I watched it and I was like, this is incredible. She's like, I told you you'd like it. Um, the uh, It's brilliant. I think it's one of the best bits of television I've ever watched. It's fantastic. Again, purpose, uh, know your audience, know what, I mean, they are, in terms of storytelling... It's the storytelling, the characters, the, I mean, the, the you know, the both protagonist and antagonist at the center of the whole thing um, was incredible. No, it's, uh, I agree. Well, Niall, thank you for the time. I mean, uh, we know we, we talk maybe too often together, but <laughs> thank you for, for taking the time to, to make this podcast. Uh, I hope the, the listeners have a better understanding and can see a bit better what's more cap and how that will for me at least change a lot sport and entertainment uh, we'll definitely share videos and continue to to try to have people grasp what it can do for for ip owners by by showcasing as well the work from from creators uh and uh yeah i mean thank you thank you for the time and Let's catch up some sometime. JB, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you again for having me on. It's always good to catch up. So um, I will no doubt speak to you very soon, but thanks again for having <laughs> me on the podcast. Cheers, man. Thanks for listening to our podcast. We hope you enjoy it as much as we love creating them. If you like the episode, feel free to comment, rate, and share with people around you. You can visit our website, www.lastsource.io to learn more about our activities. You will discover a wide range of articles and can subscribe to our newsletter to receive the latest tech and sports news in your mailbox every month. Stay tuned for new episodes. Le Corner.